Well, we're at session seven in our intimacy with the Trinity in John chapter 15. And I titled this, it's kind of a strange title, but I titled it after my own personal testimony. Is that my favorite verse in the Bible for many years is John 15, 9 and John 17, 26. You got to put them together. And tonight we're really looking at John 15, 9. I'm giving it the 10 and 11 because these three verses together are so power packed. And it ends with a promise of great joy in verse 11. We're not going to really break down verse 10 and 11, just kind of reference it. But I've uh, looked at this verse 9, John 15, verse 9, over the years, for many years. And there's moments, not always, I don't want to exaggerate, where I am just awestruck. It's like, Lord, this really can't be. But I know it is true. Give me living understanding. Let me feel more of the truth of this. And there's those times over the years where I feel more than other times, and I'm awestruck by it. It ends with a promise of joy in verse 11. Paragraph A, the reason joy is so important, some folks think of joy mostly as, uh, and I don't mean this negatively, but kind of giddy and happy, and they're laughing and jumping and high-fiving, and that's kind of fun. But joy is far is much more than that. I mean, certainly that you could that could be a part of it. But joy is a deep sense of well-being in God's presence, a deep sense that things are right and God is with you. And I think of joy in that bigger sense, and that's the kind of joy Jesus is speaking about here in John 15, verse 9 to 11. Again, we're not going to look so much at the joy. Maybe next week we'll break that down a little bit more. It's a big, big subject. Paragraph A, the greatest pleasure available to the human spirit are spiritual pleasures. It's when God reveals God to the human spirit. That's what I mean by joy. When God reveals God, when God the Spirit reveals the beauty and the love of the Father or the Son, something in our being is grabbed in a way deeper than any experience a human can have. I like to remind people that it's a very simple principle, but a lot lose sight of it, that we are freed from the grip of the inferior pleasures of sin by experiencing a little bit the superior pleasures of the gospel. I mean, a lot of folks, they lock in and they want to deny the inferior pleasures of sin. I encourage them to change their focus, pursue the superior pleasures of the gospel. Jesus called it his joy, called it the revelation of the way the Father loves him and the way that he loves us. That superior pleasure, even a little bit of that, is the sustaining power to get free from the inferior pleasures of sin. But if you lock in on deny, 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 and that's all you do instead of pursue and drink deep, you'll end up not having near the amount of victory. Paragraph B, let's look at these three verses. I mean, verse 9 is power-packed. And I'm going to say some of the same things over and over. I just can't say it enough. Verse 9 has two, I believe, of the most dynamic truths in the Bible. One phrase after the other. And each phrase is not meant to be a complete subject, but rather I call it the title of a book in God's library. Meaning each one of these two first phrases, many, many, many implications to each one of them. Each one of them are like a book of unfolding understanding. So he gives two dynamic truths and then one commandment, a very important commandment. Truth number one, verse nine. As the Father loved me. Beloved, the way that God loves God is a glorious truth. It's a very empowering truth. It's a truth that a lot of folks don't spend much time cultivating. But I want to suggest to you, it's one of the most important truths 
to ignite joy or the superior pleasures of the gospel, the way God loves God. Now, rather than giving the entire statement, he just gives the introductory, the way the Father loves me. Then he gives the second dynamic truth. I love you in the same intensity. That is staggering in its implications. Then one commandment, abide or stay focused on this truth. Live in conversation with me around these two truths. And the Lord knew that as simple as those two phrases are, if we would abide in them, if we would engage with the Lord around those two truths, many implications that would come from those two truths would begin to little by little slowly unpack in our understanding. And it would awaken dynamic love in our heart. I mean, joy in our heart. Then he goes on, says that if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He gives this key qualifier. Because some folks have this idea they can abide in God's love without a spirit of seeking to be obedient to his leadership. And of course, most of you know that it's critical that we have a spirit of obedience. Then Jesus says in verse 11, and we're just gonna barely look at verse 10 and 11 tonight. He goes, I've told you, verse nine and 10, I spoke these truths to you. Here's the reason. Because I knew that if you engaged with me according to these two truths and this commandment, my joy would be awakened in you. And it wouldn't just be an impartation of my supernatural joy, but it would mark you to where it would be your joy, it would remain in you. It would become a part of your personality, not just an impartation that came here and there, but would actually become a part of who you are in your character in an ongoing way. That's what he means when he says, my joy will spark your heart, but it will be your joy, it will form your character in a supernatural way that will surprise you. Now the reason this is so important, verse 11, he goes, these things, he's talking about verse nine. And yet it's easy to ask for joy and skip the these things, the truths, that if they're engaged with, Little by little, they will awaken joy in the human heart. And joy is the most power. We call it peace or call it joy. I mean, they overlap so much. This deep sense of well-being and security and goodness and confidence about the future and about the present. That's what joy is. Paragraph C, you're going to notice there's a circle of love involved. The way the father loves the son and the implication is the way the son loves the father. Well, it keeps going. It's the way they love their people. And it's a way the people love God and love one another. This cycle just builds and builds inside of the family of God. Paragraph D. Our experience of, God jo of, of God's joy, of this awestruck reality. And again, it's not a overwhelming every minute of the day. At least it's not been that way in my experience. But it, I, I have those feelings more in the last several years than years before. Because I've taken verse 9 seriously. I want to... I want to abide in the truth of how the Father loves the Son and how the Son loves me. I want the Spirit to unpack those realities using the written Word of God. Our experience of God's, our experience to experience God's joy, whether it's those momentary impartations where His joy awakens us, or it's that more sustained ongoing character formation where joy becomes a part of our literal of our human experience because of this, the joy of God has marked us, but now it's our joy. You're gonna notice five different truths in these chapter 15, verse uh, nine, 10, and 11. And I'm just gonna say them real quick and you can re look at them later. And the reason I, I'm almost being redundant because I want you to get this so clear that you can talk to God about it and you can tell other people about it. Number one, I'm gonna say what I just told you. We're gonna grow an understanding of the intensity of the way the Father loves the Son. There's nothing more intense 
in, in existence than the way the Father loves the Son. And of course, the Son loves the Father, and the Son loves the Spirit, and the Spirit loves the Father. It's, it's all the different dynamics within the three persons of the Godhead. That's dynamic truth number one. Dynamic truth number two is to grow in the in understanding, the intensity. Jesus says, I love you like he loves me. Like, this really? That is a massive statement. I love you in the same intensity that he loves me. And you remember at the Last Supper, he told them during the supper and then right afterwards in the, on the way to the garden and in the garden, he goes, and all of you are going to deny me and you're going to stumble tonight. So Jesus wasn't speaking in idealism like, I love you because you guys are so committed. He goes, all of you will abandon me tonight. But this truth is going to actually recover you and restore you. I love you in the same intensity, and I fully know your weakness far more than you do tonight. And this very truth is going to actually be used to recover their testimony and their faith and confidence in the Lord. Number three, the main commandment, abide in the reality of the love I've just explained to you, Jesus was saying. To abide in it, one translation says, remain in it. Another translation, <clears throat> it's the same Greek word, live in it. Meaning, stay focused on this truth. I don't mean every minute of every day. All of us have different assignments in the Lord at different seasons of our life. You know, maybe those assignments will go for five or ten years or longer or shorter, but... We all have different assignments over the course of 40, 50, 60 years. But what Jesus is saying, whatever assignment the Spirit gives you, never let it have a greater priority than this one, staying focused on these two truths. Like the Lord has given me focus on other truths, but he whispers, abide in this one. Don't ever graduate from John 15, verse 9, never. Never get so locked into other truths and assignments where this gets diminished. And of course, uh, it has got diminished at times in my life. But the Holy Spirit helps to recover me back to this. I go, yes, I commit myself to abide, to stay locked in to this reality, to study it, to talk to you about it, to search it out. And then he gives a key qualifier. He says, you know, this is requiring a spirit of obedience to walk in this. You're not going to sustain this by simply claiming mercy. There has to be a sincere reach of the heart and a spirit of obedience. Our obedience may not be as mature as we want it, but the reach to obey is what I mean by the spirit of obedience. Because some people, they read the love of God and all they see is mercy, and they say, no, I'm wholehearted towards you in my love, and I want you wholehearted towards me. I love you with all of my heart and all of my strength, the Lord says, but I want you to love me that way. Of course, our all is small. Our all is fragile. Our all is weak. But he says, understand when I say I love you, don't put everything under mercy I, and you live the way you want, but it's in context to you reaching to walk in a greater spirit of obedience as the days unfold. And then he gives the fifth point, which is a glorious promise. You'll be awestruck. You'll have this transforming joy. Your, your heart will be captured. I, again, I call it the superior pleasures of the gospel. When this is working in us a little bit, he gives us a far greater advantage over the inferior pleasures of sin. If this isn't working in us, if we're spiritually bored, we're sincere, but we're spiritually bored and spiritually dull, the inferior pleasures of sin are, power, are far more powerful. You don't want to walk out into that war zone of this world without some of this joy, this superior pleasure in the gospel. Paragraph E. Paul said the same thing, but he used different terminology. Ephesians 3, he spoke about comprehending, understanding. Look at these four things, the width, length, depth, and height. That's what I, over the years, I call Ephesians 3.18, the ocean of God's love. 
Paul says, if you can know, he means experience it. He doesn't mean just cognitively be aware of it. But if you experience a little bit of this, it's going to fill you to the fullness of God. And what that means, that doesn't mean all that God has you're walking in, but it means you're going to be equipped to walk in the fullness of God's purpose for you in every season of your spiritual life. The fullness of God is a, I mean, in the absolute sense, I mean, we'll, a billion years from now, we'll never exhaust the fullness of God. But I want to walk in the fullness of what he's ordained for me in this season of my life. And what Paul's saying here, it's critical that you engage with me according to the width, length, uh, depth, and height of my love. That's what's going to equip you to walk in my purpose for this season of your life. And I just got a sentence or two for each one of those words you can look at on your own. Let's look at paragraph F. Well, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God. Then he went on to say, this is the first commandment. This is the great commandment. That's what we sound like to the Lord. He goes, I love you. Oh, Lord. He goes, no, no, I'm really on your team. I'm really for you. I really am. In the prayer room, when I hear babies cry, I go, guys, that's what we sound like. I mean, the angels go, aren't they cute? We love them. They'll get it. They'll get it in a minute. (laughs) Actually, I really believe it. (laughs) That's how it really is. But he really likes us. Jesus defined loving God as the first commandment. Now this is an interesting thing. There's a, he only said it one time in the whole Bible. The command to love God with all your hearts mentioned a number of times, but only one time does God give us the information. This is what he sees as first. Top priority to him. And the reason, uh, I mean, it's top priority in the way God loves God. He loved God the Father loves the Son with all of his heart. The Father loves the Son with all of his strength. I mean, this is glorious to meditate on. God loves us with all of his heart. That's why he wants us to love him with all of our heart. Again, our all is small. But he says, bring the all into the relationship. So the command to love God with all of our heart, it doesn't begin with us. That's the glorious reality. It's existed in the fellowship of the Godhead from eternity past. God loving God with all of his heart. Then he, then in the fellowship of the, uh, the councils of the Godhead, they determined to create a race of beings where they could love that race of beings with all of their heart, called humans. That's why he created humans. Then he says, now I want you to enter into that all of your heart relationship and a Again, our all is really small in this age. But he says, bring it. Bring it. I'll help you. Because it's the only way we're created in such a way in the image of God. That's the only way we can thrive in the spirit if we're seeking to love it with all of our heart. So much of the gospel preaching that I've heard over some years, uh, you know, dumbing down the the, the call to obedience and the and the radical uh, empowering of the grace of God to obey, thinking they're doing people a favor by dumbing it down and saying, well, don't be burdened with this, don't be burdened with that. Beloved, you are created by a God who loves with all of his heart to love with all of your heart. Without that pursuit, I mean, we don't attain that far, but without that pursuit, we don't thrive. We, our, our humanity doesn't work. When I t- talk to different preachers over the years, I go, you're, 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 you're actually condemning the people, trying to give them a break. You're actually condemning them to spiritual boredom. They will only thrive if they're reaching with their all. Now, when we reach with our all, we see our weakness, so we got to understand the gospel so we know that when we stumble, we run to him and we don't run from him, but the reach is still there. Top of page two. Well, John would say later, the same John who wrote John 15, obviously, he said, God is love. Now, I want to say this. God is wholehearted love. The essence of God's being is wholehearted love. 
The only way God loves is wholehearted. He can't love any other way. Love by, defini by definition demands expression. If God is wholehearted love, he has to express it. The love that the Father and the Son and the Spirit share from eternity past with one another, because it's truly love, it has to be shared and multiplied with others. So they're the genius of creating a race of beings that they could bring into the pleasure that they experience Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, the blessed Trinity. The Father saying, we've got to bring others into it because it's so delightful to us. That's the power of love. Now, God didn't create us because he's lonely. He didn't create us because he was lacking, like, you know, it's only the three of us. It's kind of, sure wish we had some more folks who liked us. He wasn't lacking. He wasn't lonely. He wasn't discontent in any way. He created us because he was overflowing with delight. He said, we've got to share it. This, it's got to be multiplied. It's got to be shared. It's got to be passed on. It created us because he is love. And love demands it. Paragraph J, let me restate again. Again, those of you that are new here, my main spiritual gift is repetition. <laughs> Actually, I think it really is. <laughs> I've said that as a joke for years, but I repeat more than anybody I've ever met. But one reason I love these truths, I love just to say them. If you guys all leave, I'll just keep saying them. I love to say these things. Because when I say them, not always... It touches me more when I say them, when I say them to God, when I just say them to myself, knowing God's listening. It just, it just bubbles up a little bit. Not always. Sometimes I don't feel anything, but I just love to say these truths. I want you to note there's five distinct but overlapping expressions of God's love. Number one, God loves God. Get big, big subject. The fellowship in the Godhead, the way the Father loves the Spirit, the way the Spirit loves the Father, all the implications of that. With all of his heart. Number two, God loves people with all of his strength and mind. Number three, he calls us to love him with all of our heart, all of our strength. Number four, now this kind of surprises some people, we begin to love ourselves in the grace of God. Love who we are in his grace. I don't mean love who we are in the flesh that's contrary to his will, but who we are in his investment in our life. Because we hate our identity outside the will of God, and we hate our life when it's engaged in, 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 in disobedience, but we love who we are in the grace of God. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he's talking about in the grace of God. And I use the same illustration every time. The, the lady prayed, oh, God, I want to love my neighbors. I love myself. And the Lord shocked her. He goes, that, you do. That's why you hate your neighbor, because you hate yourself. You have no power. You have no overflow to love your neighbor. And then number five is the loving others with all of our heart. Beloved, I'll never love you more than I'm at peace with the investment God made in me and the grace of God. And when I delight in that and many things I don't like about some of the ways I think and talk and feel and all those things, but I love who I am in the grace of God in his investment. And I thank him for it. And it gives me energy, gives, it kind of frees up our emotional bandwidth where we have some energy to love other people in the overflow of that. In paragraph K, our foundational, one foundational premise of the kingdom. Again, it's the same thing. These two sentences, John 15, 9 and John 17, 23, my goodness. Well, we're at 15, 9 again. Jesus said that these things two times on the, at the Last Supper or there on, the, on that final evening. He goes in this, verse 59, catch this. In the same intensity the Father loves me, I love you. Then look an hour or two later in John 17. In the same, he's praying, he goes, Father, Father, that you would love them in the way you love me. First he says, 
I love you the way the Father loves me. Then he says, the Father loves you the way the Father loves me. Like, are you really? I mean, do you really believe that? You know, you might say, Jesus, I mean, you've been with the Father from eternity past. You have all these shared experiences. We're new on the scene, and we stumble and fail so much. Are you troubled that he loves us like he loves you? And Jesus would say, no, I'm not troubled at all. It's, it, it, it touches, it delights my heart. Yeah, but isn't the equation kind of not fair? No, no, love doesn't view it that way. My father loves you the way he loves me. That's good. Like, really? Boy, you're not like one of us. We'd be threatened if we were radically committed in a relationship and someone new comes along and all of a sudden they love that new person like they love you. You go, wait, 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 wait a second. I'm talking about it in a friendship context. And one thing I've said all through this series, we're actually teaching uh, uh, six 15-week series on John 13 to 17. So we're planning to do about 75 or 80 messages on this, go about two years on Friday nights. We're going to do line by line through John 13 to 17. And those that are just new with us, uh, I'm just tipping you off on that. And you can follow along on the Internet, and everything's archived. And if you wait a week or two, we have the transcriptions as well. I'm a transcription guy. I love to read and study. I love that more than listening. Some people like listening more than reading. I like reading. So I love transcriptions. It's my love language. If you give me a birthday present, give me your transcription. Don't give me a shirt. Give me your transcription. <laughs> I've got plenty of blue shirts. I'm fine. I'm good. <laughs> but one thing I, I, I say uh, all the time is that in, in this 75, 80 week Friday nights, about two years worth, we're just going line by line through John 13 to 17. I see it as the greatest teaching given by the greatest teacher in human history. I see these uh, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, these five chapters, the greatest teaching by the greatest teacher, I believe that in there are the truths and the promises that will equip the, the heart of the overcoming bride in the end times. But I've said that over and over through the other messages, and those of you that have been around, I don't, I don't want to keep saying it, but the point I, I'm going to make here is that when I find a Bible truth, I like to stop and say, thank you, God, show me more. And I have found the simplest, the, that simple phrase, if you will read a glorious truth and not just underline and go, wow, but you'll actually talk to the Lord for just a moment, turn that promise into conversation. And if I, I start almost every time with, thank you, Father, that you love Jesus. Show me more. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me like the Father loves you. Show me more. John 17, 23. Thank you, Father, that you love me like you love him. Show me more. And, and if you just do that in just kind of a slow, calm way, you'll add some other phrases on there, and you'll get in the conversation with him just a little bit. But a little bit of this over time will change your life. A lot of folks would read these passages and go, wow, amazing, go right on. And the Holy Spirit would say, well, stop. Bring that truth into conversation with me, and you'll feel joy a little bit. Not every time, but over time, the joy will start growing in you. L, our hearts are awestruck as we grow in understanding of some of the mystery, the depth of the mystery of how God loves God within the Godhead. I want to be awestruck as I get a little bit more understanding the way that the Father delights in the Son, the way they partner together, the way they talk to each other, the way they are mutually involved in everything they do together, the way that they're enthusiastic in relationship with one another. They're never bored. It's never distant. And there's many, many facets of under the subject of how the Father loves the Son. I like to say, Father, show, thank you, show me more. And the Holy Spirit would say something like, if you ask me, I will. Again, not every time you're going to get some big download, but you do that over time, you're going to start picking up little phrases, new phrases of understanding, are going to new glimpses into this glorious, glorious treasure hunt. And our hearts, paragraph L, are awestruck as we grow in understanding of some of the mystery of this. Paragraph M, God never changes. 
There's several passages that make that real clear. Malachi 3, 6 we have it, which means God always loves in fullness. He's always 100% true to who he is. He never can change. Never even one moment does God love less than 100%. He's not for one moment less than 100% wise. He's never less than 100% righteous and merciful. And he never suspends one attribute to, to exercise another. He's 100% all of them and all that he does. And that's kind of a cool phrase, but the point meaning that he never grows in love, he can't. He's always 100%. And he never diminishes in love, ever, forever. And the takeaway from that is that even in our spiritual life, that he is committed to us even in our weakness. He looks at us, he goes, I still love you with all of my heart. I can't love you less than that. You can enjoy less than that. You can refuse to uh, receive it, but it's still offered to you. Or I would deny myself. We must see the first commandment in the eternal context of the fellowship of the Godhead. Meaning the first commandment's not just one of the many kingdom ethics. You know, we gotta serve one another, we gotta love God with all of our heart, we gotta be generous with our money. You know, we wanna use our time in a, in, a, in a wise way. Loving God with all of our heart is not one of many kingdom ethics. It's absolute, it, when we see it in its eternal context, that's how God always loves God. And that's the way his family is. Paragraph, oh, God's desires, or let's say his affections, are the most important reality in life. The way God feels, I believe, is the most important subject. The why behind the what. We understand a little bit of the what he created in Genesis 1. That's the what. He redeemed on the cross. That's the what. He leads our life in good ways. That's a what. But there's a why behind the what. Why did he create? Why did he redeem? Why does he lead us? Because he has infinite affections and desires. His power and his wisdom. He's got infinite power and wisdom, but he uses power and wisdom in order to carry out his loving desires. It's not the other way around. It's not like he shows power and goes, Ooh, oh, yeah, every now and then I want to show love. He, no, he goes, I'm going to use my brilliance and my power to manifest my love forever and forever. Paragraph P, God always loves us in the way he loves Jesus because he only loves in fullness. Now, that's the sort of thing you want to say, you want to stop when I'm doing this privately. I say, thank you, Lord. Show me more. Show me this. You only love in fullness. You can't deny yourself. Teach me, Holy Spirit. Again, I don't know that there's any one day it all comes together, but a little glimpse here and there, and those glimpses build over time. He does not withhold his love. When a sincere believer stumbles or struggles, I'm talking about a sincere, a sincere believer, say, Lord, I'm wanting to obey. I'm stuck in this area. I'm not at peace that I'm in this area. I'm fighting this area. I'm trying to get out of it, but I'm not out of it. Our spiritual immaturity does not affect the way he feels about us. He never loves, loves us less. Understand this. He never loves you less today than he will a billion years from now in the perfection of the resurrection. A billion years from now, he will love you 100%. He loves you 100% now. It never grows. It never diminishes. It never changes. Now, some would say, wow, well, then, hey, I'll just do what I want to do. No, no, because you'll experience more of that love in this age as you mature. When we mature, it enables us to experience more, but the love has been there all along. The enemy does not want you to grasp that. The enemy wants you on the hamster wheel of trying to motivate God to pay attention to you. I'll fast, I'll pray, I'll give money, I'll do what, I'll jump through whatever hoops if there's a chance I can motivate you to like me more. 
Of course, that's legalism, but the enemy never wants you confident in the love of God because you get confident in the love of God, nothing can stop you. Nothing can stop you. Because even when you stumble, but you're confident, you run to him, you don't run from him. Because you know what his heart is like. And you don't know just suddenly one day, you know because you've been taking these truths and speaking them back to him day in and day out. I don't mean all day, every day, but these are part of your conversation with the Lord and these glimpses of truth and these glimpses of living understanding continue to grow in our life. Roman number two. The Father's love for Jesus. It's the highest affection conceivable. I mean, the way the Father loves Jesus. Oh, my. What? Now, I'm saying this to spark, to inspire you, not to condemn you. How often do you think about that? The way the Father loves the Son. How often do you thank God for that and ask him to show you more? And my point isn't, for some of you go, Ooh, I haven't done that much. That's not my point. My point is, that's a glorious treasure hunt. The Spirit of God is in beckoning. He says, hey, let's go on this treasure hunt. There's so much I have to show you over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and the next 10 or 20 or 30 million years, and then the next 10 or 20, 30 million after that. We will never exhaust this. I have some phrases here. It's kind of rapid fire. I just want to throw them out there to you about how the Father loves the Son, just in the Gospel of John. The point is, you want to search out these statements. I've got a handful of them just right there in front of you. And we look at them, okay. Every one of them, we say, thank you, show me more. But then we say, Lord, I want to, I'm going to study what other teachers in the body of Christ. If I can get a good book on the love of God, I've got scores and scores of them. Because there's a teaching anointing on many different people through many different centuries. And there's people that had a teaching anointing in the 1200s. They talk on the love of God. I want to take a shot at it. I want, I want to get something from them. I don't want it all direct. I mean, I'd be happy with it. It didn't work that way. He gives it to the whole family. And he calls us to honor and love one another by, by receiving from one another. Search these out. These, these phrases. Every one of these have significant implications to them. I mean, the way Jesus taught, he, th he throws out these mountain statements is what I call them, meaning he throws a one-liner out here, the Father loves the Son, he gave everything to him. Excuse me, what? Gave everything to him? Yeah. John 3, 35, that's not the sort of verse you want to just go on to verse 36. We stop and go, What's that mean? You mean in time and eternity? All authority over angels, demons, money, wisdom, history. What do you mean everything? I mean everything. Oh my goodness. This is huge. That's the treasure hunt I'm talking about. I'm not going to read those. But I just, because we're just looking at John 15 verse 9, I'm throwing out that first phrase, the Father loves the Son. Many implications. I mean, this is just barely a, a whisper of it. It's a big, big, big subject. Paragraph C. Before Jesus' temptation, before he went to the wilderness, the Father says, you're my beloved. Then some years later, right before he would go to the cross, he says it again. You're my beloved. Before he faced the temptation and before he faced the cross, the Father re-energized him in his human frame with the revelation, you are my beloved. Jesus in his humanity needed the Father to say that again and again to him, or, or I don't know the amount of times, I don't want to speculate on that, but my point is, in his humanity, the Father spoke this. My point to us is, he will speak these things to us. I don't know, we'll get them audibly. I don't really imagine that's going to happen very often. But we can get it through meditation on the Word. We need to know our belovedness. Before we pray, face temptations and before we face heroic self-denial in obedience, we need a fresh revelation. We are beloved to our Father. That's not a one-time deal. This is a 
a, a diet of reading the word. Lord, I'm facing temptations. I don't know when they're gonna get bigger or smaller. And there's this heroic sacrificial love in obedience at key times in our life. Everybody, every one of us face a couple of those moments. I need to be energized by this reality. I need to know the way you love G the Father, uh, Father, the way you love Jesus, Jesus, that's the way you love me. I need to, a new, a fresh infusion of that reality. Paragraph D, I like to say, I just already said it three times, but I like to say, thank you, Father, show me more. Thank you for the intense, pleasurable way you love Jesus. Show me more. And Jesus, thank you for the intense, infinite way you love me. Show me more. I need that infusion of I'm your beloved. I can't face temptation or, again, heroic, sacrificial moments in the will of God without that infusion in my heart. If Jesus needed it, how much more do you and I? Paragraph E, I'm talking about the Father's love for Jesus. He goes, I'm going to make him preeminent. And there's so many expressions of the Father's love that are in verses where the word love isn't mentioned. I'm going to give him the preeminence in everything. That's how much I love him. And he would tell his body, the body of Christ, because there's only one Jesus in preeminence, but I will work good for you beyond anything you can imagine. You can't imagine, because I love you like I love him. We have different roles and functions, and there's only one preeminent man, the beautiful man, Christ Jesus. But the point of it is, the Father says, I have great plans for you that will unfold over millions and millions of years. You can't even grasp who you are to me without me giving you more insight on it. Paragraph F. As we read the Gospels, again, it's the same state, statement I'm making. Just write through the Gospels. Well, it's right through the Old and New Testament, not just the Gospels, but stop. When you see something about the way the Father and Son interact, the way where Jesus treats people, just any, any promise, thank you, show me more. Show me more. You want to say thank you, show me more all the way through the Scripture. That's the prayer I pray by far the most of any other prayer. Thank you, show me more. And, the, and kind of the complimentary prayer, I, I pray the same thing but a different way. I say, Holy Spirit, let me see what you see and feel what you feel about the way the Father loves the Son, the way the Son loves me, the way the Son loves you. Let me see what you see and feel what you feel, Holy Spirit, about the way Jesus loves the people that I'm connected to, about the way Jesus loves our city. Let me see what you see and feel what you feel. It's kind of the same prayer as, thank you, show me more. Those are my two kind of go-to prayers. I mean, you think, you know, here I've been leading the house of prayer for 23 years, and I go to the prayer meeting, open my Bible, I can't think of anything to pray. <laughs> I'm like totally tired. Like, okay, I'm gonna do the thank you, show me more, let me see what you see, feel what you feel. I start with that. I go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I knew that verse, okay. You think by now I would just have all of them all ready to go. But I go in my human dullness and my tiredness, but I just start with those two prayers all the time. I got them memorized, they're not that hard. Paragraph, Roman number three, the way Jesus loves the Father. Oh my, this, I mean, it's a big, big subject, bigger than tonight. But I'm just still in the theme of the way God loves God. The way God loves, the, the Father loves the Spirit, the way the Spirit loves the Father. The way they honor and speak about each other. It's not just the word love you're looking for, it's the way they interact, it's the way they esteem each other. It's, it's uh, the way they serve each other. I mean, they, Father, Son, and Spirit all have a servant heart. They delight in serving. But Jesus, here in John 14, because we're in John 15 now, but just this was in our last series we, we looked at this, when Jesus makes this incredible statement, the very end of John 14, he goes, they're still in the upper room. They've just eaten the Last Supper, take, you know, having Passover and, and the, the First Communion. And Jesus says, the ruler of the world is coming, but he has nothing in me. And what he means is, Judas has left. I've sent him. What thou doest, doest thou quickly. The Roman guards will be here. 
under Judas's guidance as to where we're meeting. They're going to be here very quickly. But I want you to know that though Satan has manipulated Judas and the Roman guards, Satan has no advantage over me. You're going to see me die by this time tomorrow, but I want you to know, Satan did not win and he did not trick me. He gained nothing in me. It's my plan. I came to go to the cross. He says, verse 31, don't think when I'm dead tomorrow that Satan won, but I'm going to the cross because for billions of years, it will be stamped over all of history. All the nations will know. I loved the Father. That's why I went to the cross. You're going to see it, but you're going to be confused at first. But one day, all of history, all everyone in hell and heaven, angels, everybody will understand I did it because I love the Father. Jesus' love for the Father, that's one of the best verses of his love for the Father. Paragraph B, it was the most costly display of love for the Father. I love the Father will be stamped over history forever when we view the cross. I mean, even a million years from now. And there's so much more that we could talk about Jesus' love for the Father. Well, I'm going to slip one more in. Paul's talking in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, then comes the end. And when you read the context of the thousand-year millennial reign, he goes, then comes the end, Paul's talking, when Jesus actually takes all the kingdoms of the world, he delivers them up to his Father after he's gained the, his, all the nations of the world. Every sphere of society has come under his leadership, his wisdom, his power, his riches, his wealth that filled the earth. He goes in verse 28, when everything is made subject to Jesus throughout that thousand-year period, Jesus will then... Take all the kingdoms of the world. He will bow down and submit them to the Father as his gift of love. And he will submit himself. Say, Father, I only did it for you. That's the love the Father, Son has for the Father. There's many displays of this in the scripture. I just wanted to put a few little, just a short little moment of that. Look at Roman number four. Jesus, the same verse, but now we're looking at the second part. Jesus loves us in the intensity he loves the Father. The Father loves him. Jesus loves us with all of his heart, like the Father loves him with all of the Father's heart. Paragraph B, beloved, this is the ultimate statement of your worth, that this glorious man, fully God, fully man, I love you with all of my strength, but every one of you will abandon me tonight. But the love is there. Beloved, that statement is the ultimate statement of your worth as a human being. And I like to say this, some kind of have fun with this, but I kind of really believe it. This one verse, there's many other, gives us the right to stand before God as God's favorite. I go, here I am, Lord. I failed. Receive my repentance. I stand before you as your beloved, as your favorite one. I know there's a billion others, but here I am, Lord. I'm the disciple whom the Lord loves. And the Lord will wash your spirit with that truth if you'll take it. I mean, if he loves me as much as he loves Jesus, I mean, if Jesus loves me as much as the Father loves me, I'm the favorite. I don't care if there's a billion others. I'm good. You know, John said it five times. John the Apostle, in the book of John, he called himself the disciple whom the Lord loves. You know, because Jesus said this, you know, I'm not putting down these other guys because we're going to be friends in eternity forever and I don't want to have to take my words back, but all these other guys say, hey, I'm Peter, I'm James, I'm Paul, I'm this, I'm that. John goes, I don't know about all that, I'm the one he loves. <laughs> no, five times, it's the only way he referred to himself as the one, the disciple God loves. And like when I get with Peter and those guys, because we're all going to be friends forever, I'm going to say, you were at the same supper. How come that never got in your letters? And he may have an answer that makes me feel stupid, but I'm going to say, why didn't you ever say it? John said, I wouldn't get away on no one else. I'm the disciple God loves. I'm going with it. 
Paragraph C, the Father's love for Jesus. It's the source, it's the measure, it's the assurance of his love for us. I'm gonna say that again. The intensity and the measure, the way the Father loves the Son, that's the source of Jesus' love for us. I mean, it's all together, Father, Son, and Spirit. I'm not making one or the other. You know, they're all the mystery of how they relate. But it's the measure and the assurance of his love for us, Jesus says. Beloved, do you know why the kingdom of God is so secure? The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. Nothing can break the cycle of love. Nothing can. We've got it made. Yes, 70 years on the earth, 80 due to strength, Moses said. There are really rough seasons. We all have really rough seasons. We all have uh, 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 heart-wrenching failures. We have disappointing delays. We have setbacks that are painful. We have betrayals. Everyone does. You got 70 or 80 years on the earth, then billions of years. It's part of the aristocracy of the New Jerusalem. You're part of the royal family forever. I don't like setbacks. I don't like pain. I don't like betrayal. It's a minute and a half. It's 80 years. We have billions of years. Let's look at Roman numeral five. Statement number one, the way the Father loves me, that's a mountain truth. Statement number two, that's how I love you. Then one command. I call this the most important commandment in the Bible. Abide in this love. Stay locked in to these two truths because these two truths have a multitude of implications. These two truths are just like, again, I call them the title of the book in God's library on that subject. Many, many, many truths are the outflow of those two. Jesus said, abide, stay focused. Keep in the conversation with me about these truths. Ask me to show you more. Search it out. Go to other teachers through history. Talk to one another. Ask for dreams and visions. Search it out. Stay in this conversation. That's what it means, abide in this truth. It means more than that, but be intentional about staying involved in it. Paragraph C, one of the ways that we abide in this, we abide in love or we live in the realm of the truth of the way God loves God and the way God loves us. When we do that, by this ongoing dialogue with him, again, I don't, I don't wanna ever exaggerate because exaggeration never helps anybody. I'm not talking about an unbroken every minute, every day, but throughout the day, this is part of the dialogue. Thank you, Father, for the way you love Jesus. Show me more. I, I don't do it every day. That, that, again, that, wouldn't be, uh, exa that would be an exaggeration. But I try to go to bed every night saying John 15, 9, and wake up every morning, make it my first prayer. Father, thank you for the way you love Jesus. Show me more. Jesus, thank you for the way you love me. Show me more. I set my heart to abide in your love. Help me more. Sometimes I wake up and I go, oh my gosh, I gotta go. And so I forget to say it because, you know, you've had those days, right? I'm running late. But I like to start and end my day with that. So it only takes 90 seconds. Or if I'm driving somewhere for a few minutes or longer, I like to just whisper that just as I go. Paragraph D, God's primary method in changing people. Paragraph D, God's primary method is changing people is to reveal how much he loves and cherishes them. I mean, we all kind of know that. Then why aren't we staying in the conversation with him more? Why aren't we searching this out more? Paul's John, this is again, John's writing this some years. I mean, he wrote this at the end of his life. First John, he wrote the gospel at the end of his life too, so maybe he wrote them in close proximity time-wise. I don't know. Nobody knows for sure, but he said this. Behold, the quality of love the Father has for you. Behold means search it out. means observe it. Study it. Consider the quality of love. I'm, that's really just saying the same thing that I've been saying. You know, I talk to young people, we, you know, we pray for revival. Oh, and they, oh, when revival comes, I go, let me just let you know that this 
abide in love or behold the Father's love, it's the same thing, is the primary occupation of your life before revival, during revival, and after revival. So we're not waiting for revival to do this. This is the number one thing before, during, and after. There's other things that will happen in the midst of a historic outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but nothing will be more important than this. Beholding the quality of love the Father has, or as Jesus called it, just abide in my love. Stay locked into this subject. Paragraph E. I see five parts of this intimacy process. Five parts. And it begins with knowing it. it meaning it begins by hearing a message, by studying it in a book. Somebody tells you, you read it in the Bible. It starts with intellectual knowledge. Some of you, possibly tonight, this is the first time you've thought of some of these things. It starts with knowledge. But then it goes from knowledge, like, oh, that's good to know. Then it turns into conversation. We take the knowledge into conversation with him. Thank you, show me more. Then when you, and again, that's not the only phrase you say, but start with that and you'll, other little phrases will just start coming here and there. Then after that knowledge gets in your conversation with the Lord, then there's illumination. Little sparks of insight start coming. Oh, I'm understanding more of this. Those little sparks of insight start coming. It inspires you to go deep in God and to pay whatever price and to resist sin and to endure persecution. It inspires us with courage to stay steady. And then after that, that transforming joy, that awestruck moments where Yes. And so I see this. I start with knowledge, turn into conversation, little sparks of living understanding. Not much, a little here, a little there. But boy, that gets me going. I get inspired to go deep with God. Like I've had people ask me, uh, you know, I do Q&As all the time with visiting leaders or, or internship or whatever. They go, what's helped you keep going all these years? I go, I'll tell you for sure. I take the Bible and I turn it into conversation with a person. It's these five things. And it gives me courage to keep going. If I quit doing that, I just, I, I just slump into spiritual dullness and spiritual boredom because that's our default. Well, let's go to paragraph J, the very end. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. What's our response? What is our response to this quality of love? You are worthy. That's our response. You were slain so that we could be kings and priests. You bore the price so we could enter into this state of nobility forever in your family. Can you imagine the price he paid so that you and I would be in this incredible position of nobility and privilege forever and ever, part of the aristocracy of the New Jerusalem. We are truly part of the royal family forever. He's altogether lovely, altogether worthy. I have in paragraph J. He's the one who is so high. I mean, he's fully God, infinitely exalted in his person. He went so low, he became a man and bore our, the penalty of our sin so that we could come so near him we could serve with him as kings and rule and be priests near his heart because we're so dear. Like I say, the one who was so high went so low to bring us so near because we're so dear to him. You are worthy. Beloved, the devil's a liar. He tells us that thing tomorrow or hitting us right now is, is, is too much. It's a lie. It's not too much. It's hard, yes. I don't like it. Nothing is more important than this. Amen. Let's stand before the Lord.